you're visiting with us as well. And uh, you're not a member of the New Testament Church. And uh, you do again work with the church somewhere. You may notice that this is this is Easter uh, holiday. Many people many people seek to that they come to the church on Easter and on Christmas two times a year. Uh, you won't see a passage broken here this morning. But every first day of the week, every Sunday that we meet, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We take the Lord's Supper and we think about when we take the bread, we think about the body of Christ being abused and the suffering that went on with that. When we drink the fruit of the vine, we think about the blood of Christ that was spilled for our sins. And uh, then we think about the resurrection that occurred over the first day of the week. Jesus said, I'll, 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 I'll come back. I'll be resurrected from the dead. That, we celebrate that every Sunday. So, it's not just one time a year that we, that we uh, pay attention to the sacrifice of Christ. But we should ever Every first day of the week, we should, uh, as an example that he gave to his disciples on the night of, the, of what we call the last Sunday, we participate in this communion service where we partake of the bread represented by the body of the Lord, the crucified body of the Lord. We partake of the, the, the fruit of the body represented by the Lord. And we'll do that at this time. Let's give thanks. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for this bread, which represents the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as he suffered upon the tree of the cross. And may we thank you this and remove all the worldly thoughts from our mind as we contemplate and consider that sacrifice that was made for our sins. First day of the week, we lay by the store.
we might work to earn a living. And we pray that as the day, the first day of the week approaches, that we purpose in our hearts that we would give back some of that to the furtherance of the church.
after the sudden and unexpected loss of our uh, sister Janice Sparks. And uh, as we, we think about her, I thought we'd just start off this morning with a prayer. If you would, pray with me. Our Holy Divine Father, God, we thank you so much for opportunities like this. To be able to come to you, Father, and be able to share and just open, what, open up our hearts and share exactly what's on our hearts, and you already know. Father, thank you so much for listening, and thank you so much for caring, and thank you so much, God, for offering to heal our broken spirits. And God, thank you so much for promising us victory. And thank you so much, God, that after there are dark days like Good Friday and Saturday after that, we're reminded in Scripture that there is a resurrection. Father, we thank you so much that when we get bad news, it's anything like a death, and we lose a loved one, we lose a family member, we lose a fellow Christian and a fellow brother or sister in Christ, we're reminded by you and your wonderful story that death is not the end. And that's because we serve a risen Savior. And Father, I, I think we all know that probably one of the greatest sermons in Scripture is probably found in Matthew 28 and verse 6. And one we don't talk about often that was delivered by an angel. Or on that day, he just had two points in his sermon. The angel said, he is not here. He is risen. And so, all of us Christians, God, we... As followers of Christ, we take solace in that. We take comfort in that. Jesus defeated death first. And every child of God will defeat death as well. And so, God, we ask you at this very moment in time that you bless Richard, that you bless the entire family, that you bless all of the loved ones, and, Father, all of the church members here as we go through the coming days ahead to deal with the visitation and the funeral deal with coming to grips with Janet's loss. We thank you for the time that we had with her. We thank you, God, for the many ways she inspired us. And God, we also smile for the many ways she made us laugh because she was feisty. And God, we, we thank you so much for that unique personality. We just pray, dear God, that you help us as we hopefully aren't saying goodbye as much as till we see you again. Father, we pray this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I want to start off with this old story that I thought was so funny years ago. There was an engineer who had an exceptional gift because he was pretty much able to fix all things mechanical. And after serving his company as a loyal worker for over 30 years, he retired a happy man. And so a few years go by, and the company, they call him up because they come across a problem that they could not seem to fix no matter what they tried. And so it was a problem that was on one of their multi-million dollar machines. So the company was desperate. So they decided to call this retired engineer who had solved all of their problems in the past when it came to things like this. And so the engineer, at first, he was reluctant. But then he decided, okay, all right, I'll, I'll help you out. So he spent a whole day going over the huge machine. He studied every last piece of that huge machine. And at the end of the day, he marked a small X in chalk on a very particular part of the machine. And he said, that's where your problem is. So the company replaced that part and the machine, well, it worked perfectly again. And so the company got a bill from the engineer the following week, and they opened it up, and it said $50,000 for services rendered. And so they emailed the engineer, and they wanted a, an itemized invoice, line by line, for all the charges. So the engineer, he sent back another brief email that said this, one chalk mark, one dollar. Knowing where to put that chalk mark, $49,999. I've always loved that story, and it makes me think about how impressed that we can be when we think about people who have certain kinds of knowledge. And this man had particular knowledge that was very valuable. Have you ever thought about how, how 
how much random knowledge that we have out there in the world. Even when we think about trivia, trivia in the world, I think, fascinates us. Number one, here's a trivial fact. Sources say that cats can make over 100 vocal sounds and dogs can only make about 10. Another trivial fact, another source says that a snail can sleep for three years. Number three, another trivial fact, rubber bands last longer when they're refrigerated. But don't try to eat them when you get them out of the fridge. Number four, the average lead pencil can draw a line 35 miles long or write 50,000 English words. Number five, did you realize that one quarter of the 206 or so bones in your body, one quarter of those 206 or so bones in your body are actually in your feet? And number six, I've read that your eyeballs they stay the same size from birth until you die, but your ears and your nose never quit growing. And we're like, great. And we've seen that in some, maybe some of our relatives. And like, man, I think that's true. Uh, especially when they lie. Uh, and I also don't have the, here it is. I can't see it, it's so small. And so all those random bits of knowledge are so interesting for us. All those bits of trivia, all this knowledge that we can have. Do you realize that with all this knowledge that we can have, that it doubles close to every five years? That it doubles close to every five years? Let's look at this. People are adding information to Wikipedia faster than we can read it. 1,000 unique articles are added every day on top of all the edits and additions to existing articles. Did you know that we're creating 6,000 tweets per second? Over 48 hours of YouTube uploads per minute? Now, we've even come up with a new word that came out a few years ago that describes the feeling that we get when we are overwhelmed with all of this knowledge, when we are overwhelmed with all of this information. And the new word that we came up with is this, infowhelm. Do you ever feel infowhelm? especially when you get on the computer, on the internet, when you get on your phone. But there is only one person, there is only one being, only one being who is not intimidated by all this information, by all of this knowledge, and that's the creator of everything there is to have knowledge about. While our knowledge has limits, our knowledge has limits, God's knowledge does not have limits. And we call the fact that God knows everything, what do we call it? The fact that God knows everything, we call that long word omniscience. God is omniscient. The fact that he knows everything that could possibly be known. God is omniscient. Psalm chapter 147 and verse 4 says this. He determines the number of the stars and he calls them each by name. Great is our Lord, and mighty in power, his understanding has no limit. When we think about God, there is no question that he cannot answer. You ever thought about this? God never has to Google anything. I don't know how many times during the week I have to Google something. And I sometimes ask my wife, I do this often during the week, what is so-and-so? Google it. You know, she, nah, there's probably 20 or 30 times a week she's giggling. I'm like, okay, okay, and I've just gotten where I've stopped asking her. So God is, he never has to Google anything. God is, is never surprised. God is never shocked. God never goes, oh, really? God knows everything that has happened, everything that is happening, and everything that will happen. There are specific points about God's omniscience, about what God knows, I think, that are beneficial for us to know and are beneficial for us to be reminded about. Because sometimes we realize life hurts us, and we need to be comforted by our Father, and we can be comforted by our Father from this knowledge. Notice in Scripture, Psalm chapter 139, verse 2, we notice what it says. I believe this is David speaking. God, you know when I sit down, and you know when I get up, you know my thoughts before I think them. 
Now, when we think about David saying something like this, this is not something that I understand him to be terrified about. This is not something that I understand him to, to dread. I think he finds comfort in this. That God knows him inside and out. He took comfort in that. And we should as well. What are some things that God the Father knows about me? And what are some things that God the Father knows about you? Well, let's think about this. God knows all your faults and failures. God knows all your faults and failures. He knows all my faults and failures. And yet, He still loves you. And yet, He still loves me. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13, the Bible says, it's a paraphrase, Nothing in all the world can be hidden from God. Everything is clear and lies open before Him. And to Him, we must explain the way that we live. Now, Mark Twain... Uh, once said this, I always loved his, his wit, but he once said this, he said, every person is like the moon, we all have a dark side. Every person is like the moon, we all have a dark side. And as long as we try to hide our sin, what we find out, and David found out as well, sin will control us. Sin will oppress us. Sin will guilt us. But when we are like David, simply honest with God, it's like someone takes a huge rock off of it. I mean, it's absolute relief when we confess and unload that sin. And to David, the fact that God knew him inside and out, that comforted him. God does not want us to pretend. God doesn't look down on us when we confess sin. God is proud of us when we admit our faults and our failures. Look at this great text. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 9. 1 John 1, 8 through 9, the Bible says, If we claim to be without sin, well, we deceive ourselves. And then the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Well, what else does the Father know about you? What else does the Father know about me? Well, Here's something else. He knows all of your feelings, and he knows all of your frustrations. He knows all of your feelings and frustrations. Notice Psalm chapter 31 and verse 7. Scripture says, I will be glad and rejoice in your what? In your unfailing love, for you have seen my troubles. And you care about what weighs on my soul, says one paraphrase. God the Father knows your heart to the nth degree thoroughly. Why? And how can he know it so thoroughly? Well, because Jesus came to this earth in human form. His son experienced every type of pain, physical, emotional, social, every type of pain that could be experienced to the maximum. But Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 promises us that Jesus, he can empathize with us because he's seen it. He's felt it. He's experienced it. Yet without sin. Now notice what God said in Psalm 56 and verse 8. This is such interesting, inspired poetry. You'll notice what it said there. God, you keep track of all my sorrows. Or some versions say you kept count of all my tossing. You, know, you can't sleep at night, you toss and turn. God, you keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one of my tears in your book, it said. And is that not impressive? That, that Jehovah God has, has counted every tear that has crept down your cheek. Every single one. And he knew the hurt that caused that tear. And that lets us know there is no hurt that you experience that God does not notice. No hurt that you experience that God does not know. Psalm 103 and verse 13, the Bible says this, when we think about God being the Father, Psalm 103 and verse 13, Scripture says, The Lord is like the Father to His children, tender and compassionate to those who fear Him. And so God, He, he knows all of our feelings, He knows all of our frustrations. What's the fact that I can take away from that hurt? Well, here it is. 
The fact that I can take away from that hurt is God sympathizes with your hurts. He doesn't just know them, he sympathizes over your hurts. Well, through Jesus, he has experienced all of that in one way or another. He sees them, he understands. So, what is my response to him? I need to give these hurts to God. I need to give these hurts to the Father. God who knows everything, well, what else does he know about you and me? God who knows everything, he also knows your fears. God the Father also knows your fears. He knows everything that makes you uptight. He knows all of your relationship fears. He knows all of your physical fears. He knows all of your financial fears. He knows all of these things. Jesus said in, in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, a paraphrase of Matthew 6, 30 through 32. Notice what he said in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, if God so clothes the flowers of the field, which are alive today, burnt in the furnace or the stove tomorrow, is he not much more likely to clothe you? Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry and keep saying, what should we eat? What should we drink? Or what should we wear? That is what unbelievers are always looking for. For your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. You know. Can, can we even imagine this? Imagine this life with no fear. Can we imagine that? This is the possibility, I think, that's behind Jesus' question that comes up in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 26, just a couple of chapters after this. That verse where he replied, remember Jesus said, Oh, you of little faith, why are you so, what? Afraid. Remember what was happening then? In Matthew chapter 8? There was a big storm. A big storm that just popped up unexpectedly while Jesus and his disciples were on a boat. And in the great storm, in the Greek language, it's where we get our word earthquake. I mean, this was a tumultuous storm. It's where we get our word earthquake. And listen to this. Matthew used that word only on two other occasions. Once at Jesus' death, when the earth shook at the cross, Matthew 27, 51 through 54, and again at Jesus' resurrection when the graveyard quaked, Matthew 28, verse 2. And we think about that. Those were great shakeups. Defeating sin on the cross. Defeating death at the tomb. Silencing a fear and a storm. We learn from that passage that following Christ means, yes, we're, we're still going to experience storms. The disciples said the same things that we say when we are in the middle of our own storms. Mark 4 and verse 38, does this sound familiar to something that we might say ourselves? Mark chapter 4 and verse 38. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? If you notice something about that question, if you notice something about that passage, they don't ask about his <coughs> power to stop the storm. Hey, God, can you, hey, Jesus, can you stop me? They don't ask about his knowledge of the storm. Do you have any experience with the storm? Do you know how they work? No. They call his character into question when they're in the middle of a storm. God, do you not care? A teacher of mine once said, he said, that's what fear does. Fear makes us skeptical of God's goodness. It makes us ask questions like this. Listen to this. This, this quote that my teacher gave, it just really impacted me. I was telling Joy about it. She said, Wow, that, that really hit me as well. But he said, it makes us ask questions like this. If Jesus can sleep during storms, does God sleep during hours? It makes us sometimes ask questions like that because of fear. Fear stirs up a lot of doubt if we let it. Fear makes us forgetful. Forgetful about what Jesus has done. 
forgetful about how loving and caring God is, it's no wonder that Jesus came to fight a war against fear. Because it's a battle for our trust. God is aware of all your needs. Financial needs, social needs, physical needs, relational needs, spiritual needs, emotional needs. God is aware of all of those needs. He knows. You don't pray to reveal your needs to God. Remember Jesus said He knows your needs before you even ask. So when I bow my head in prayer... And I say, here, God, this is what's bothering me. Here's what's frightening me. Here's what's keeping me up at night. And again, remember, he's omniscient. He knows everything. I'm not telling him anything he doesn't already know. He's waiting for us like a father would a little child to see us reach up and say, reach down and pick me up, Father. That's what our prayers are for. Our prayers are saying to God, I depend on you, God, not to tell him something he doesn't know. So we can have access to this power he wants to freely give us to help us navigate life, to navigate our storms. So God wants us to place our trust in him. So what you do is faith is a sign of trust. And so you obey, you do, you serve, you, you worship because you trust God and trust is the act of depending on someone else to do what is needed. I found this really interesting from several years ago. There were several missionaries who were trying to reach the Chamula people in southern Mexico several years ago. They were trying to teach them the gospel, and they were having a really hard time because, as you know, when you maybe come from an English-speaking nation, you go to another foreign nation, and you're talking to somebody else, there's always that language barrier. So they were having a really hard time trying to teach the gospel. And they kept running into problems when they preached to them or taught them. And here's why. The Chamula culture has no single word in their language for faith. Can you imagine that? The Chamula people have no single word in their language for faith. And so in fact, when translators finally discovered not a word, but a phrase. They had to come up with a phrase to convey the meaning that they were trying to get across to express faith when they finally came up with something that they could translate, have translated to where they could understand. They crossed a major hurdle, and these people were able to receive the gospel, and they started to change and be transformed by the gospel. But the funny thing is, they couldn't come up with one single word for faith, but they came up with a phrase. And when I saw that phrase for how they translated faith, I thought it was so good for us to see. And here is what they came up with. For the Chamulas, faith is taking seriously what God has obligated himself to do. I really like that. I mean, I think that translates to us so well also, doesn't it? Faith is taking God seriously about what he has obligated himself to do. Trusting God completely means having faith that He knows what's best for your life, that you expect Him to keep His promises, and to help you with your problems, and do the impossible when, when necessary. In the midst of the quaking storm, Jesus stood and He calmed it. How? With one word. That's what God wants to do with the shakeups in our lives. And so, somehow, at some point, God wants to provide us calm. Let's not forget, as we consider God's omniscience, as we consider what God knows about you and what God knows about me, I want to encourage you this morning as well to do know this. God also knows your faithfulness. God knows your faithfulness. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me here. I'm not saying this so that we'll get a pride-filled heart like, oh God, aren't you lucky to have me on your side? I'm not trying to say that. I'm not talking about throwing our elbows out of socket trying to pat ourselves on the back. But here's what I'm talking about. Our God wants us to know something like this. In my omniscience, God will be saying, in my omniscience, in me knowing everything, I appreciate every act of faithfulness that I see in you. Why? Why would God want us 
to see that he knows our faithfulness. Because he's a great God and he's a great encourager and he's a great teacher. And what do we know? The positive reinforcement encourages us. Gives us long-term motivation. So I don't want you to leave here without knowing this. That God knows all of your faithfulness. Every time I do wrong, yes, God knows. But every time I do the right thing, Every time you do the right thing, God is watching, God knows. Every time you resist that temptation, God knows. Every time you help somebody, no matter how small or how insignificant it may seem, God sees it. A couple of verses verify this. Jesus said in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, talking about giving, notice what he said in Matthew 6. Verses 3 through 4. But when you get to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. He's watching. He knows your faithfulness. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 42, the Bible says, Jesus said, if, if anyone gives even a cup of cold water, one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will not lose their reward. He knows your faithfulness. The fact is, every good deed is going to be rewarded, regardless of how insignificant. And whether or not anybody else on earth saw it or not, every kind word spoken to a child, every thoughtful act to a spouse, every time you pick up around the office or the house, Every time you cook a meal, if it's for that family or somebody that's not doing well, every time you say one encouraging word to another human being, every time you, you start up a conversation about Jesus Christ and the gospel, God sees all of that. God sees every act. And I just want you to imagine, not you patting yourself on the back, but I want you to imagine your Heavenly Father patting you on the back. Well done, my good and faithful child, my good and faithful servant. You just keep that up. But the more and the longer that we live in this life, here's what we learn. That we really do need to be living our lives for an audience of one. We need to be living our lives for an audience of one, just for God. Because He's the one who made you. He's the one who's going to take care of you. And every good deed is going to be rewarded. And I think that's why Paul gave us that great wisdom in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. Notice what he says. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest. We will be rewarded if we do not give up. I like something Mark Twain said. This is another one I'm going to pull from him, Twainism. He once said this. Most of us don't need to be told a lot or retold a lot, but we sure do need to be reminded a lot. And so that's what this sermon has been about today, so that you might be reminded a lot. God knows your faults and failures. He still loves you. Be honest with him. Your Father knows your feelings and frustration, so give him your hurt. He knows your fears. So give your fears to Him. And He knows your faithfulness. Your Heavenly Father knows everything about you. And He wants that to be the most reassuring thing that you can hear today. And this morning as we close, I hope that this has been reassuring to you. That we've talked a lot about what God knows. But I don't want you to leave here without knowing how much God loves you. And how much he values you. And every act of faithfulness that you give in his name. Several years ago, uh, I remember a very difficult time in my life when I was a freshman at Creed Harbor. Uh, my family going through a divorce uh, when my dad had left the family. And uh, I remember sitting in chapel uh, one Sunday and I was just not a happy camper, you know. And Ralph Gilmore got up, and uh, I just felt like that chapel message that he brought that day was 
You know how you sometimes you feel like that's just for me. And he got up and he read something I'd never heard before, but I've heard it several times since, and I read it over and over again. But it was the first time I'd ever heard it, and you probably heard it, but it's always good, like Mark Twain said, to be reminded a lot. Uh, so I want to read this that Ralph read years ago in Free Hardman Chapel. It's called Letter from a Friend. It says, I just had to write to tell you how much I love you and care for you. Yesterday I saw you walking and laughing with your friends. I hope that soon you want me to walk along with you too. So I painted you a sunset to close your day and whispered a cool breeze to refresh you. I waited. You never called. I just kept on loving you. As I watched you fall asleep last night, I wanted so much to touch you. I spilled moonlight on your face, trickling down your cheeks as so many tears have. You didn't even think of me, but I wanted so much to comfort you. The next day, I exploded a brilliant sunrise into a glorious morning for you, but you woke up late and rushed off to work. You didn't even notice. My sky became cloudy, my tears would rain. I love you. Oh, if you'd only listen. I really love you. I try to say it in the quiet the green meadow and in the blue sky. The wind whispers my love throughout the treetops and spills it into the vibrant colors of the flowers. I shout it to you in the thunder of the great waterfalls and I write love songs for birds to sing for you. I warm you with the clothing of my sunshine and I sprinkle the air with nature's sweet scent. My love for you is deeper than the ocean and greater than any need in your heart. If you'd only realize how I care, I died just for you. My dad sends his love. I want you to meet him. He cares too. Fathers are just that way. So please call on me soon. No matter how long it takes, I'll wait because I love you. Your friend, Jesus. I always found that to be so encouraging especially when we go through difficult times, that God wants to let us know just how much He loves us. And as we think about today being Easter, and we thought about the last couple of days about how death has impacted us, I came across something earlier this morning a friend of mine posted on Facebook, and I wanted you to hear this. So I added this a little while ago. Wes McCaddy said this, he said, the Christian faith is paradoxically one of nearly overwhelming grief and inexpressible joy, held together by a cross and an empty tomb. We cannot celebrate the joy of resurrection until we first lament the pain of death. And what a beautiful way, I think, for us to end the lesson this morning. So the lesson this morning is yours. And I want you to know that God loves you. And one thing, if we love God, he said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And in John 15, 14, he says, you are my friend. If you do what I command. If you need to be baptized for forgiveness of your sins, God has commanded that. God wants to wash away your sins in Christ. And we have a perfect opportunity for you to do that. Or if you simply just need prayers for brothers and sisters, if you need prayers for this church, why don't you come now as we stand here as we see.
I would just like to say what a blessing it has been to be here today, to be with our spiritual family, and to be a part of this worship service today. Amen. Again, let's remember Richard and the family and dealing with the loss of Sister Janet. Continue to pray for them and strength in the coming days. I would also like to ask all of you to please pray for Drew and Roger and myself as we are preparing to make a decision on hiring a youth minister. Please pray that whatever decision is made will be the decision that is in accordance to God's will, that is best for the spiritual growth of our youth group, and it is best for our church family here for us too. Are there any other announcements need to be made this time? If not, we'll ask for Clay to come and just let us in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we're thankful for this beautiful day that you've given us. Dear Lord, we're thankful that we can come here and be together and worship you. Dear Lord, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for what it stands for and what we can remember. We're thankful that Christ came to earth and gave himself on the cross for us, for us and was resurrected so that we could one day live in heaven with you. Dear Lord, we are thankful for every blessing you give us, physical and spiritual. Dear Lord, we pray to all those that are sick, pray to those that are hospitalized, those that are still dealing with the virus, we pray that you just do and bless them. Dear Lord, we pray to those that have lost loved ones, we especially pray you be with the Sparks family, we pray to be with them and bless them and bless us as a congregation. Dear Lord, we pray that you will be with us as we leave this place. We pray that you will help us to grow as Christians each day and be safe until we meet back again and worship you. We pray. Amen. Amen.